Well, come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord with my family. Revelation 7, 9 says at the end of time, we are all going to worship at the throne of the Lamb together. And so I'm looking in the face of my family. And so I count this as an opportunity for us to have a family reunion and a family conversation. So y'all don't have to go to the bathroom. There's no turkey in the oven. We're just going to sit here together because what we've heard, what's been set for us, should set our souls on fire. We should be putting fear under our feet. And we should have a passion more than ever before to say, not only can we do this, but for the sake of a generation and a world, we must do this. Today, I want to talk with you from this idea, defending without offending, presenting the beauty of the gospel in a deeply divided world. And so I'm grateful to my brother Andy Cook and Ed Stetzer and to my big brother for entrusting me and for each one of you for entrusting me with this moment. I want to talk with us because it's an important conversation, one that is central to all of us as Christians. It is the sharing, the proclamation of our faith. In particular, I want to talk about presenting the beauty of the gospel in and to an incredibly diverse deeply divided and often polarized world, a world that is perhaps more combative than ever before, but also more desperate than ever. I want to focus not so much on the challenges of who we're talking to, but how we are engaging them. And want us to look to the word of God that we might understand that despite the often harsh and sometimes justifiable critique, of cultural trends and norms which seem to be moving throngs of people away from the reality of Jesus. I want to remind you of something. The church of Jesus Christ still holds the compass that points to the shores of heaven. That is in our hands. And the world will not know if we forget that the compass toward heaven, that the one that gave his life for us still resides in us. That the power of the Holy Ghost is not sometimes, he is all the time, and he is churning on the inside of us. Number two, the streets of the world are full of people who need what we have, which is hope and belief. Remember the word of God says in Ephesians 2, therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves circumcised. Remember that at a time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. And if he himself is our peace, and if we can do greater things, then the world may seem like a formidable opponent, but the greater one is with us. Martin Luther said one plus God is a majority. So what are we waiting for? And who are we waiting for? As our brother Sam said, it may be dark, the world may be dark, but I propose darker world, brighter Christ. Darker world, brighter Christ. In May, several years ago, the eyes of the world turned on our fair city of Minneapolis. As people counted eight minutes, nine minutes, and 46 seconds as we all watched under COVID as the breath of George Floyd left his body. Media came from all over the place. Those of us who live under the shadow of the state capitol heard the cries, we saw the fires, but what the media will not show you was the place of the church. The church was in the street from day one. The church was crying out. Pastors, black pastors, white pastors, on all different ends of the spectrum stood together and linked arms as the third precinct burned. They stood together and prayed, as our brother Sam said. But here's another piece that the media did not show you, is that in the midst of it, In the midst of the things that you saw, what they did not show you was former prostitutes, pimps, 
drug dealers, and hurt, anxious young people who came to what now is known as George Floyd Square and cried out to God that they might be saved. There were days where there were so many young people who came. We had to pick up our own water bottles and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You see, the media is here in Satan's domain. I do not understand why we give so much power to media, which has nothing to say about Jesus and everything to say about what is wrong. If we took part of the time that we spend listening to media, if we loved the Lord and spoke of the gospel that much, who could be changed? Who could be changed if we refused to be fearful? If it was not an us versus them conversation, if we were not so focused all the time on our denominationalism and on the one who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who changes the world. You may call me crazy, and maybe I am, but I was also a young woman who was desperate. I was a young woman who grew up in the church, but Jesus was always past my fingertips. I did not know how to get him. My sin was ever before me. And I longed for the church, someone to come and tell me as I sat on my stoop that Jesus loved me despite all my failings, that I didn't have to be a certain color or a certain size, that I didn't have to do anything with this young man or that young man to be enough. I saw churches on every corner, but they were locked. I saw children in the street, single mothers with cigarettes in their mouth and babies in strollers. I saw kids shooting crap, but I saw no pastors. I did not see the church, and the urgency of that hour propelled me into ministry. Yes, I am a female. Yes, I am African American. But more than that, this is simply the car the Holy Spirit is driving. And we have got to do the work. We have got to cry out. It's not about our make and model. It's about our passion and purpose. And there is a generation that is out there that is desperate. Jesus knows something about being in an opposing place with opposing forces. He used 12 weirdos to turn the world upside down. I think he can certainly use a few of you weirdos in here too. Amen. Here's the reality, beloved. The only way that they will know they, the black kids of the city of Chicago, they, the gay kid who struggles with suicidal ideation, they, the single mothers, the prostitutes, they, the broken of society, the only way they will know is if we go. They are not going to come to us. They don't care about our steeples. They don't care about those things. They want to know, is my life redeemable? Does my life have purpose? I see right now the enemy roaming as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Children are skipping the church and going to suicide. Fentanyl is taking our kids out in rapid order. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of going to funerals where nobody believes that the dead can be raised. I'm tired of burying young people. I'm tired of holding mothers. I'm tired of taking what I have and holding it on a gunshot wound. I'm tired of young people fearing going to high school because they do not feel safe. I am tired of the church feeling afraid of a generation that needs us more than ever before. The gospel is one of intimacy and Jesus is a God of proximity. And unless we sidle up to each other, lock eyes with each other, say, I love you because you are made in the image and likeness of God. If we can't look at each other with love and grace, if we can't hold each other's hands in the midst of the fire, what do we have to offer the children of the world? Children who are dying under the weight and the fear of social ills. We say we believe. Why are we so offended when they don't believe what we say and how we live? Modeling the way of the master has been essential for me in the work 
of bridge building and repairing walls. As a youth and young adult pastor for much of my professional life, 30 years, yes, I am well preserved. I have learned the importance of two primary things, listening well and being and refraining from judging other people's worldview. Listening well is essential. And the reality is, in the noise of this culture, there is a generation that though they are locked and loaded into social media, they are desperate for an older man or woman to sit with. This is a generation that does not despise you being older. They are not even looking and wondering and saying, I need a black person to talk to me if I'm a black person. If they are hungry and your hand has bread in it, feed them. The desperate are hungry. They are hungry for relational depth. They are hungry for purpose. They are hungry for someone to lock their eyes with them and say, you're not too far gone. They need to know that we were once sinners. I sit on the board of Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge has been an incredible witness to me. And I don't know how many of you in here have anyone who is addicted to drugs or if any of you have a testimony of being freed from it. But one of the things I love about being on that board is that every time before we begin a meeting, somebody who is in that program comes in. I remember one woman coming in one day and she stood before us and she locked eyes with us to tell us her story and she be began this way. I am a mother and I love my children, but I loved methamphetamines more. I was shaken to my core, not because it was unbelievable, but because I've never seen such candor in the body of Christ. We're so afraid of what someone will say. We've watched pornography. We're struggling in our marriages. We bounce the check. We're so focused on how we appear that people never really know what is real and what is artificial. Jesus needs us to be fully free. Amen? Who the Son sets free is fully free indeed. I took him at his word. A young woman who felt as though the gospel was too hard and that the one who didn't look like me was past my fingertips. Until a group of young people, when I was in college through a ministry called Campus Crusade, actually showed me what friendship looked like. It wasn't about my race or theirs. It is simply that they had found good news too good not to share. And they shared it with me. This church girl who knew what we did on first and third and second and fourth Sundays, but didn't know the Lord of life. And they brought me near, and they're bringing me near, like many of you have brought me near, has taught me courage, has taught me something about getting out of my comfort zone and wading into the deep, into the faces of a generation that do not look like me. Brothers and sisters, the generation that we currently serve Gen Z is the most populous, most, most uh, diverse generation in world history. They don't have the same hang-ups we used to have. The methodologies of pizza and Coke don't work anymore. They are asking critical questions about deeper matters. Having been born with phones in their hand, they have seen the fall of the Twin Towers. They have seen their friends shot and running out of high schools. They have seen people run for their lives, but none of them they are proposing are running to the church. Where is the church in crisis? We must be front and center, eyes blazing with fire, black folks and white folks, young folks and old folks, Asian folks, locked arms together with a passion to change the world. One of my favorite books is a book called Walking with the Wind. It is by Representative John Lewis. He tells the story of the civil rights movement and the difficult years when he as a young man wanted to desegregate Troy State. So he wrote a letter to a young man named Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, I'm gonna desegregate Troy State. 
Dr. King said, boy, before you lose your life and your mind, get on a train and come here to see me. John Lewis sat with Martin Luther King Jr. and learned something about nonviolent social resistance. He sat under the tutelage of brilliant men like you and brilliant women like you, and he learned something about patience and trust. He learned something about walking into darkness. And one of the things I love about the name of it, Walking with the Wind, a memoir of the civil rights movement, which I suggest that you read, is where that name came from. John Lewis was a man who was raised in Alabama in the midst of the trees. And for any of you Southern folks, you know something about when the winds whip up. And he was talking about Alabama storms. And he recalls a time where he and uh, his cousins, little kids, were all together there in a little shotgun shack with their auntie. And there came a fierce storm. And as that storm started to whip up, they started to see the corners of that little shack started to raise. And the, his auntie called the children together. And she stooped down to them and she said, now children, this is what I want you to do. I want you to link arms with me. And everywhere that you see that house rising, I want you to walk together and collectively our bodies are going to hold down this shack. And for two hours they walked from corner to corner and he says we were walking with the wind. We were walking in the fierceness of the storm. Though we were small, though we felt like we had not much, collectively we kept that house on the ground. Do y'all know where I'm going today? You may feel small, insignificant, that your culture is different, but oh, brothers and sisters, if we lock arms across this nation and across this world, as the houses of our culture continue to rise, we can collectively hold down the morality of the world and of the nation if we trust that God is with us. There is nothing that God cannot do. And as a result, they took that little boy from Troy, Alabama, and he stood in some of the greatest places of the world until his death. There have been times in my life, dear brothers and sisters, where I have been more offended than doing a good job at defending. Anybody been there? Yeah, yeah. Anybody been there where you had all the right things? You had your four spiritual laws. You even ate your Wheaties that day. You had cracked your knuckles and you were ready to roll. But then somebody said something to you that made you feel like they felt in Numbers 13. We looked like crickets, grasshoppers in our own eyes. You see, God has given us a land, a promised land. He's given us a promise and a commitment. But when we lose our focus and we look like grasshoppers, when we think that the enemy is bigger than we are, we lose focus and we leave the promise to somebody else. I don't know about you, but I didn't get saved to leave the promises of God on the shelf. I did not get saved and surrender my life to let young people waste away we can blame the culture all we want but while we sit in our hallowed halls children die and while we want to blame the culture you can't ask the culture to act saved but i sure can act save people to act saved and we got to act like we remember like we know who our savior is like we are truly filled with the holy spirit and his power we've got to remember that there's nothing too hard for god We've got to remember that even when we go out into dark places, there will be those who will say, it's just too hard. But our brother told us there's nothing too hard for God. If you're sitting here in your right mind, you're a walking miracle. And you weren't too hard for God with your messed up, jacked up self. So listen, make a little room for a child of God. Make a little room for a misfit. Make a little room for that single mother who, yes, has asked you to help her with rent five times. Make a little room for that kid that is mentally burdened with their sexuality. Because here's the reality. 
We can be mad all we want with a quote-unquote liberal agenda, but unless the people of the gospel have a different and better way, we have nothing to talk about. The reality is a generation wants to know that we love Jesus first. We need our own sexual ethics to get together. We cannot be watching pornography in the numbers we are watching it and tell a generation of young people that they need to be spiritually and sexually holy. They are looking for consistency, continuity. I know I made some of you mad, but that is okay because we had a family reunion. Y'all wave like you got some common sense. Listen, the reality is I have messed up. I've taken the bait of social media with family. My husband and I are surrounded by family members that are not saved. I have an aunt who's a Buddhist priest, a sister who calls herself a hopeful agnostic. Most of my family are uh, people who maybe will walk into the church at best. We've been excluded. We've been ostracized. We've been talked about. It hurts. It's hard. It's frustrating. Sometimes you want to lose your mind. Like, you know, when you pull out of your parking lot and then somebody cuts you off in traffic and you forget your save for a minute. Yeah, like that. But worse. Anyone ever been there with your family members trying to be a good witness? And they take your faith and tear it to shreds in front of their friends. It's hard. And I've taken the bait. And I've had to repent. And I remember one time I got into it with my brother. He was on Facebook and my fingers were rattling faster than I even knew what I was thinking. I had no decorum left and I was frustrated. In fact, my husband heard me rattling. And for any of you who have uh, nails or people, right, he could just hear me clickety clicking. And he knew, girl, you don't type that fast. What's going on? <laughs> and he came and he saw tears running down my face and he simply put his hand over my hand and told me to press the delete button. And as I sat there and cried, God said to me, through his Holy Spirit, you're not angry because he rejected me. You are angry because he rejected you. I was embarrassed because it was true. I was sad because it was true. I was not grounded enough in Jesus because if I had been listening, if I had been praying, I would not have taken my brother on on social media. I learned that day that there is an art and a blessing, a reality of what it means to defend the gospel. In the halls here of Wheaton College is where I met amazing people, people who taught me something about apologetics, people like uh, Nabil Qureshi, people like Abdu Murray, Amy Ora Ewing, and the great Oz Guinness. It was here that I learned that the objections that the world has are not meant to make me feel less than. The objections that the world has come because there are legitimate questions that need to be answered. And that I did not need to feel offended or defensive. Instead, I needed to be a little less zealous and a little more prepared. I wonder if some of us don't go out into the world because we're really zealous, but we're underprepared. We don't know how to answer questions like, is Christianity the white man's religion? Is Christianity misogynistic? Do Christians really care about and love other people? The questions are hard. They have shifted from the meaning of life and the existence of God and the trustworthiness of scripture and the problem of evil to the conundrum of it all. Young people and older folks are in a battle for their mental minds while Satan has a heyday. Christians, we must answer the questions. Do we condone these things? Is it, isn't it arrogant to believe Jesus is the only way to God? Are Christians anti-gay? Are we anti-racist? Are we racist? Is an organized religion just a crutch and a myth? In my less experienced days, those were fighting words. Those were what we would call the Vaseline days when you put your hair back in a ponytail, got out some grease, and you're like, oh, those, we getting ready to, 
You, me, and Medea are getting ready to go in. You said, what about my Jesus? Anyone ever been there? You said, who about my Savior? Let me take my shoe off and throw it in your direction. But God said, baby girl, you're not going to bring anybody to Jesus that way. Don't you know I'm bigger? That I am who am is greater than your what if? Don't you know that I still sit on the throne? Don't you know that I am still the king? Abdul Murray wrote in his most recent book, More Than a White Man's Religion, resisting the surge against Christianity need not be motivated by defensiveness. Christendom's history hasn't been anywhere near perfect, but it has been unbalanced, tipped far more in favor of the good that it has done than the bad that the world has wrought. And if we don't study it out, if we don't believe it, if we don't have an apologetic that is rooted in the truth, we will not go to the world because we are unsure. Yes, I've had some hard conversations with atheists who were far more intellectual than me, but they couldn't outlove me. They couldn't deny the Jesus in my eyes when I looked at them and said, baby boy, I understand that you have questions that I cannot answer, but I have a God who does. Because he answered me, not in the church initially, but in a huddled mass on the ground, broken beyond measure, embarrassed and full of shame, feeling as though my life had no meaning. And in those moments, though I didn't win a soul, I made a friend. And as we think about making friends, and as we think about the work of the kingdom, it's not hit and run evangelism. It is about coming next to each other. It's about locking eyes and paying bills, about sharing a meal and having a laugh over something stupid on TV. It's about praying a prayer and bowing heads together for the first time. It's about shaking our heads in disbelief as we watch cities burn and the world turn. The reality is, is that we have got to continue to trust and believe the gospel. And God is helping us by sending us foot soldiers. Not only were the people that I sat under, Oz Guinness and others, amazing, but there are new foot soldiers to help us with the challenges of the cultural and ethnic and racial and sexual challenges of our time. Lisa Fields and the Jude 3 Project. Justin Gibney and the AND Campaign. Preston and Jackie Hill Perry are just a few of the named devoted believers who are engaging culture at the crossroads of scholarship and relationship in refreshing and amazing ways. All of them in one form or other have invoked, taught, and challenged me from the words that I want to leave with you today coming from 1 Peter. You all know it and you've probably said it. But how many of you know that it's one thing to know and say something and another thing to live it? 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another and be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that many could inherit the blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on us, the righteous, and his ears are attentive to our prayer. For, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. My God, if the evil comes from us, what shall we do? For who is going to harm you if you are eager, eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Jesus Christ as Lord. And always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. And do so with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their conduct. 
Brothers and sisters, here we receive a word from one who saw life and death. The founders of the church. But he called us, as I call you, to stand where you are, with who you are, surrounded with ever, wherever you are, and to take the gospel to the world, to the disenfranchised, to the black child, to the single mother, to the immigrant at the border, to the person who looks nothing like you, but is made in the image and likeness of God. And as you do, you will see his face shining like the sun. And one day you shall hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen.